Hello, I'm Greg Bolden, producer and creator of the TV show, The Outlet, which is what you're about to watch. But let me tell you a little bit about it. The Outlet is an opportunity for students to create content as well as come here and be interviewed to share their truth, to share their stories, to help you, the viewer, understand the teenagers of today just a little bit better, as well as the issues that are facing them. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. of the outlet today is july 1st 2019 we have a special special program today i'm sitting here with caesar and drew caesar rodney <laughs> all right uh, that's how i know him, drew so <laughs> right 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 um so this story came across my desk uh a couple of weeks ago and i said to myself i was like hey i know him i, I hosted him in a concert over here uh but i i see your photo and uh al jones yeah. Uh, standing outside Cab Calloway. And Drew, I didn't know you at the yeah. time, so welcome. Thank you. Um, but the Black Culture Club was making a statement about uh, really uh, teachers disconnect with students and racial, uh, cultural relations, maybe inappropriateness. You had a teacher that was uh, right. reading a book and thought that it would be okay when they read that line to include the N-word to the overall class. Right. And the teacher is white. Yes. yes yes okay and so uh it was a peaceful protest you walked out at lunchtime correct yeah. yes sir. and uh the news came they covered it mm -hmm. and uh so what i'd like to do is maybe have you guys tell me a little about the black culture club at cap calloway and what led, led up to these events like mm -hmm. how do we get here and then we'll go from there okay all right cool you want to talk about how we uh you know came about starting the black culture club why we did it all right yeah um so the black culture club actually was founded uh, a little bit over a year ago now by um, a graduated senior. And the initial reason why Black Culture Club was founded was to kind of create a safe space outside of our own individual friend groups for um, the young Black students at CAB to kind of have our own place to talk about issues that are going on in our community, um, Black pop culture, to have these kind of kitchen cable kitchen table discussions about you know what's going on and just to kind of express our feelings about going to school and how we kind of navigate um our own world as black individuals right and it's grown since then of course yeah. i mean we're learning from this situation and just from uh you know how we interact with each other uh we we're starting to set some more rules for you know out of a result of what's happened of course we need to have these boundaries of how we'll you know further investigate you know, situations like this that happens in classrooms, environments, and just how, uh, you know, we'll establish ourselves as a, you know, student body and uh, as a club to be taken more serious, of course, because, you know, since then we have people who were upset out of the situation, people who are pros, and uh, we can explain the situation to them. Sorry. Uh, sure. So, of course, you, you're aware that there was a uh, an English teacher who said the N-word, in uh, in historical contexts or in you know a text that's in historical you know literature, uh, to kill a mockingbird. Of course, that's a statement in itself. The N word being used in that text, but uh, it's just the fact that like who's to say you know like we don't have a right to feel the way we feel. You know, this we're saying it's insensitive, and you know we're deeming that because we are you know we are who we are. And this that book says the N word. I mean we being the only few black people in this classroom at the time, I'm sure, I mean, we feel, you know, we feel invalidated. Right. Now, how do you feel about the book? <clears throat> in, the book? In, in modern uh, culture and still using that book out of all literature, do you feel that yeah. there's still a place for that as a learning tool? I think there's definitely still place to use books like To Kill a Mockingbird and um, Huck Finn. I think that those are great pieces of American literature. However, we need to learn how to teach those pieces of literature because as you know, education evolves, the teaching style also has to evolve. And I was taught in my sophomore year to kill a mockingbird and my English teacher, she didn't have to use the N word in order for me to understand 
mm-hmm. was going on. Mm-hmm. Right. So. Yeah, and I'm sure there's other texts that have that same moral to the story, the same themes that, you know, just are more contemporary or just can, uh, you know, express itself to a contemporary audience. We don't have to always refer to these old historical texts. I mean, just To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm sure there's something else we could go about, okay. right? So uh, let's let's start back a little bit further. So Cab Calloway, our listeners are all over the world, uh, so they don't know what Cab Calloway is. So uh, Cab Calloway is a school uh, that is for the arts, as part of the Red Clay Consolidated School District, uh, you have to apply to get in there, yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. And so, and then each student kind of picks like, like that you pick a, a focus for art, correct? Yeah. yeah it's an audition yeah. process. Uh, you know, many different uh, you know, courses. Uh, there is visual arts. There's dance. There is vocal. There is okay. instrumental. You know, whether it's strings or you know percussion. And so, for my listeners, what type of diverse culture is there at Cab Calloway? Is it a diverse school? Um, you know, where does it relate yeah. as far as, uh, is, is an African-American population still a minority population at the school? Yeah. Very much you know, so. Yeah. So could you, could you speak about that just I a little bit? I definitely get asked that question now more than ever since, um, post walkout, if you want to say that, um, is CAB a diverse school? And I think it depends on how you look at diversity. Right. If we want to look at diversity in terms of color uh i think in total and looking at our numbers cab is about 12 percent african-american seven percent hispanic and then i'm not too sure what our um asian american and asian is like pan asian so all of asia um uh, what that population is and to me when you can see all of the uh majority I should say, of the black kids all sitting in one area of the cafeteria? Not really. <laughs> um, right. And then if you want to talk about diversity in terms of uh, sexuality, yeah. If you want to talk about diversity in terms of gender, no, because CAB is majority um, female school. So Okay. Yeah, no, it's very conflicted. I mean, like, it's diverse in this, like, liberal limelight that it's always sitting in, in terms of, uh, you know, sexuality and just how, you know, welcoming, seemingly right. welcoming everyone yeah, is. I, I guess I was more concerned about racial diversity. Okay. Right, yeah, yeah, You know, so, I, and yes, we're diverse in all those other ways, but mm-hmm. racial diversity, I just want to make sure that we had a basis for, you know, ev- even from a teacher standpoint, like, are you racially diverse from an education standpoint? Uh, in the classroom, do you feel that there are uh teachers that look like you no i mean like no and that's the problem you know there's people who don't look like us who are making decisions for us you know yeah and i think um again i'll always go back to just looking at the numbers because we can say everything that we want but a lot of the time people want to see it on paper and if you can go on cab's website out of um i want to say in the ballpark of 90 esque staff members only about seven of them are um african-american or of um or mixed with african-american and then about 14 in total are teachers of color or staff members of color so that's uh guidance counselors custodians um cafeteria workers um all of those people so in terms of looking in the classroom and seeing teachers like you no okay this is going to sound like a really um stupid question for me to ask but it's for my <laughs> listeners so i want you to make sure that you understand why i'm asking it right why is it important to you that there's more diverse teachers to look more like you do so why is that important to you as a student i'm yeah of course i mean this is a national issue honestly we just want to know that you know we can be in this position as well you know that's just the great uh it's just a great environment it's just a great place to be in it's just a great thing to see uh that you know you have a principal who looks like you so it's it's like i can achieve that now you know I can relate to this person. He can relate to me. He can hear my issues and, you know, vice versa. Yeah. I think a lot of it is about um, representation matters Mm -hmm. in all areas of your life. I think in the media, you don't see black teachers being celebrated. And I think especially when we get to high school and you have certain students that have, you know, different experiences outside of the quote unquote norm, you need a teacher that is able to relate to that on some sort of level and i think for a lot of black students they don't have that teacher where they can relate to i think at cab you know there are a few token teachers that you know a lot of students gravitate towards them and that's not for any other 
um, reason. It's because you relate to me as a black teacher, as a black woman. So. Right, yeah, we feel as though we have, you know, testimonies, shared testimonies as, you know, disenfranchised demographics that, we, you know, maybe they could relate to us. Sure. Yeah. Now, I'm going to, uh, language really matters, and you used a phrase just now, Drew, that I just want to uh, challenge you on. You said token teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that the teachers that you have are hired as, as token employees, or was that just a phrase that you're using as a general context? I don't think that they're hired as token teachers. I think that now there have been certain teachers that are definitely picked out because they are black. And they think that just because you are black, that now all of a sudden we're going to, there's going to be this sense of uh, pre-established relationship <laughs> when in all actuality, that's just not how it works. Yeah, a relationship can happen with anyone. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, and then right. when I say token teachers, not all of these token teachers are white. Some of them, I mean, not all of these token teachers are black. Some of them, you know, are white. They're just educated and they can, they take a step back and actually listen to us instead of always being on trying to teach us so. okay so that would at least show that the schools at least maybe in tune of trying correct certain teachers yeah sir okay in in the uh interview i was reading so uh wdl the news journal everybody uh local media um covered your story that day and i'm not sure who who it was it might have been you that mentioned you know a lot of these teachers don't even know half of their students predicaments yes yes that was me um so the question i think it would be really important is what predicaments should teachers be more aware of uh just knowing that we come from these communities and you these urban communities these communities that uh you know probably don't look like the teachers of course coming from these suburban uh you know environments so it's just the fact that like you know being in a predominantly black school i uh i went to warner elementary predominantly black very predominantly black and uh you know it's the idea that we don't have representation there are white teachers white administrators uh, making decisions on our behalf and it's just no wonder there's a disconnect you know you don't understand where we come from why we act the way we act yeah and I think on the other hand my predicament is a little different because I grew up in you know these affluent white suburban neighborhoods my entire life I went to majority white schools I've only gone to majority white schools I went to Linden Hill and I went to Skyline and now I'm here at Cab um, it's really hard to navigate the world as a black person when you don't have anyone black to talk about it with because I can look at what's going on in the news and I can look at what's going on in the media and I'm like that's not my life I don't live in those areas but it still hurts on a deeper level just because you know that like those people look like me and if I was in that area that could have very well have been me and a lot of the times like well you don't and you're not in that area but it's like no i know those people in right. like a uh in a in a weird sense so yeah right and they may even like blanket you and you know see you as you know someone who's like uneducated or just yeah. you know implicit biases of course and just treat you as, as such yeah most definitely and so i guess that leads me to this next question of how i mean how do you get uh, okay, so if you're looking at, you mentioned having white administrators and white teachers, how do you get that population to understand that better? What are some skills that you could recommend for teachers to look at in order to improve their hearts for their classroom, if that makes sense? Yeah, since this uh, whole altercation, we've been uh, told that there's been a diversity conference uh, being held in the Red Clay School District. Of course, our teachers in the ELA and history classes, they have to take this diversity course where they uh, analyze their biases as teachers, as, you know, yeah, just as instructors, of course, because that exists. And whether or not they can reflect on themselves is in, in question. And it's just a really a learning experience. I don't, I can't speak too much on it, but like sure. to know that this is happening and whether or not it's because of what we did, it's, it's definitely uh, causing some waves. and. Yeah, and also not just from um, taking diversity courses, which are always good, but talking to your minority students and not making them out to be a project and actually looking at them as human beings and actually taking the time, you know, 
out of your day to listen to what your students actually have to say. Because a lot of the times, you know, we might just be 16, 17 years old, but we have very complex and interesting stories as individuals. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of it comes from having conversation and not just teaching. You actually need to talk to your students about what's going on in their lives and how they feel and how, you know, what's going on in their lives so yeah right. yeah i mean it's just starting the conversation i feel as though that's what we're doing that's why we're here because we're starting this conversation and uh, maybe these teachers can realize that you know there are problems and maybe this will help fix it and so what year are you going into you're going uh, into senior, senior year? year and what year are you going into I'm senior year going into your senior mm -hmm. year as well 17 18 years old yes, 16. 18 yeah 16 mm -hmm. 18. 18 i mean so two young people change the world i always hear about how you know the students we work with that's that's the generation of tomorrow but it's <laughs> not and I try to impart this to, to any student of mine that your voice matters today. Yeah. And so what you're doing is not affecting change tomorrow. You're affecting change today. And so I, I, I commend you for that and everybody else that's involved with the Black Culture Club as well for what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that's really important for you to hear. Um, the other thing that really struck me that I, I thought set this story apart from other stories. I didn't see anywhere where somebody was calling for your teacher to be fired. Yeah. And I got to be honest, that was kind of refreshing. Right. Because I find so often lately now we have like social media and everybody wants to persecute people right away. And I really respect the fact that you guys went out, you did things peacefully. You called attention to something. You asked for change. It sounds like Red Clay is, is making that change happen. Like they're, they're sincere about listening to a small group at a school and applying it to the larger community, which is awesome. But were there individuals there that were upset enough that that was where they went, that they were like, this teacher, I can't believe they'd say that or think it's appropriate. Yeah, like, yeah. how did how did that go down? It's uh, our club can be very conflicting, of course. I mean, just a lot of different people, about like 26 members. I mean, we all have different ideas, different uh, ideals, raised them upon different families. So we just have a different uh, mindset when it comes to situations like this. Some people just really want to take action. Some people want to analyze this situation and just come up with a better, you know, resolve of this whole situation. Um, yeah, it was uh, very challenging. People felt as though, you know, she shouldn't be where she is, but she's been here for so long. So, of course, she won't just get fired i mean you know she's taught us and i felt as though she hasn't wronged me by you know doing this or any teacher would have wronged me i mean this school has been providing me with so much being here since i uh, been there since middle school i mean and now high school in almost uh, seven years at cap Cattle school of the arts um we can't just simply fire our teachers i mean they've uh contributed to our character i feel as though you know they've uh, been instructors uh it's just whether or not you know they've made a mistake or you know just this is part of them uh, yeah. You know, I didn't want to get into the teacher yeah. specifically yeah. for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. What I am curious about, though, as a result of this action, yes. has there been any dialogue with the Black Culture Club and that teacher? N not directly with that teacher. And just to kind of backtrack um, sure. about what Rodney said, I don't think in some cases it's definitely necessary to with social media for people to kind of jump on this bandwagon of oh she should be fired and you know throw the book at her but i think it's more so sometimes teachers need to be made examples of and you don't always need to be made an example of by firing them i think it's about action and i think it's about actually following you know protocol and looking into situations instead of just you know being like oh it's fine we'll let them handle it by themselves i think you know uh having the diversity training and all those things implemented is definitely a good thing and you don't need to fire everyone because we do live in a tough time where you know jobs aren't always relatively available and to just throw away somebody's livelihood that wouldn't be aligned with, I think, the message of what BCC is trying to do. Yeah, and we're still trying to create this message, of course. Like, even a third of a group didn't even want to walk out with us. You know, that was a very conflicting statement in itself, going to media, you know, wow. deciding whether we wanted to do this or not. And uh, it was hard to see whether or not, like, what we did was a good thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, as of now, you see the negative is the negative, and it hasn't even, uh, you know, come to the surface and all the positive has come to surface like this you know uh we've been approached by organizations that want to honor us of course um and 
us as uh, advocates for our group, you know, the uh, board members we refer to us as ourselves as, uh, we are different. We don't think the same, of course, and that's why we are yeah. in the position we are in because we can have these conversations and figure out what's the best, uh, you know, solution for whatever we come across as a group. Yeah, that situation. Um, I think I remember the time leading up to the walkout. It was the day of. And I remember sitting in um, the library of our school and just being so nervous about what was to come out of this. And then I always explain to it when I'm talking to people like this, it's not often times where you actually feel yourself growing up. And in the moment where we were actually walking out of the building and we were in like this little group, I think it was only maybe like 10 of us yeah. or so that actually even walked out. You feel yourself growing up. And then in the aftermath of the whole um, situation, reading the Facebook comments and reading, you know, the other articles that were published outside of um, W. Dell, it was really thought provoking. And I actually actually had to sit down with myself and be like, what are we going to do now? What are actual things that we value and how are we going to continue to spread this message? And what is it? You know, exactly. What is the clear message? Mm -hmm. Because now people have follow-up questions and those questions need to be answered and I felt as though I had a responsibility yeah, to do it, that. It's unscripted too like it's very scary that's why a lot of people we you know even you know as of today they, they're still like leaving out feeling as though they didn't join the group for this cause but it's just like you know it, it's something that needs to be said and we felt as though we needed to say it, whether or not we all agreed yeah we felt as though like our peers feel as though they haven't been heard so whether or not I've been in a particular situation as you I'm going to stand with you as, you know, a member of my group. Yeah. I think that's a big thing, sorry, that I try to push is that not all advocacy work is for all the advocates. Like, I definitely can stand with someone who definitely who has a completely different situation for me and say, I see you and I support everything that you're trying to do, even though I could never possibly relate to anything that's going on with you. And I think that's a big thing that people need to come to realize is that just because it's not happening directly towards you, it's still a very big problem and it needs to be addressed. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that your voices definitely were heard. I uh, had posted that I'd like to try to get you as part of the outlet to come in to do this interview. And I posted the WDEL story and a friend of mine who lives in Maine said, Wow, that actually made it on our news tonight. <laughs> so you were on the news in Maine uh, from your walkout. So while it may have been 10 people that joined you, it became a more national story. Uh, and I'm not even sure you guys realized that at the time. I think I sent that to you at one point. I was like, oh, yeah. a friend of mine reached out and he saw this in Maine. Um, I did not know that. Yes. Yeah. So, so it definitely got reposted and pushed out to all, all the corners of the world and in as nowadays things happen and, and do. Uh, there's a, a statement uh, that I know here uh, where I work. I work at McCain High School uh, where we host this podcast. And, well, they don't host it. I run the podcast here in the studio. Uh, but one of the big messages that we entered this school year with from our principal was providing equitable opportunities for all students. Have you heard that terminology at Cap Calloway? No, not necessarily. No. Do you know I, what that means? Uh, I can have an idea, and I'm sure it's like, you know, great intentions behind that, but whether or not, you know, it'll actually do what it's said to do. It's, okay, well, let me tell you what yeah. it means. And maybe, the, like, right, right. give you why I think it kind of matters towards your conversation that we're having today okay. um, and the overall. So, uh, Red Clay comes to the principals and says, hey, we want to make sure that we have equity in our buildings. Our principal, he jumped right on it. That was the first thing, like our first entire day was spent about, do we have equitable classrooms? What that means is that no matter what your race is, uh, no matter what your family background is, no matter what your economic background is, your gender, sex, you have the exact same opportunity in school as the next student. And when you graduate, there are minimums, standards, that every student will attain because it's a fair system. Mm. That not one student is more educated based upon those minimum standards than another. No one is doesn't reach those. Which in many of our schools across the United States, 
you can see where there are students that never meet those minimum standards. There are those students that do get brushed away, and it does not become an equitable system. Right. Uh, so I guess in light of what's going on with teachers and what you're calling for, uh, how important is equity in the classroom moving forward? Hmm. I mean, that's tricky because, like, you do want to, you know, have this understanding of where these students are coming from, what environments they're raised upon, you know, how they are financially and how that can attribute to their learning experience. You know, you can't just set these, uh, you know, these these standards and say they have to meet this when, you, you know, they may have some issues in terms of, you know, being able to comprehend. And I also think it's tricky in general to meet those statements when or the requirements to just in general because not every student learns the same and you have you look at the curriculum and it's taught specifically to one certain type of student and you can't do that and there are students who need extra help outside of the classroom that can't stay after to get that extra cup of the house and whether they have work they have to be home to watch whomever there are certain circumstances where certain students just will not be able to meet you know those standards but i think in trying in making an honest effort not just saying we have equitable classrooms look at us let's go i think in making an honest effort you will definitely see improvements but bottom line is you won't fully be able to achieve an equitable classroom yeah it's almost like saying like i don't see color you know yeah right i mean i had a student here uh he's my very first episode of the outlet he spent five years homeless um and he was by far one of my best students i've ever had uh close to a 4.0 gpa gifted writer uh we have a partnership with npr and delaware public media They listened to what he was writing and were like, you're like beyond where some of our senior writers are. Like you're doing excellent work. So circumstances for every student can change their ability to learn, but there are students that can rise above that as well. Yeah, most definitely. And so I find that that's a catch-22 for an educator. Because as an educator, I never want to say to a student, well, you're a student that has a trauma background. So therefore, um, you, you said it best. Sometimes we see students as projects. Uh, and for me, I, I, I fall into that sometimes with all of my students. Uh, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. But if I hear like, hey, mom kicked me out of my house and I'm now living with dad who doesn't talk to me. Like, I feel horrible for that kid and I want to do whatever I can do during the safe seven and a half hours that I have with them that I can do. Yeah, right. right? Some of my students, one of my students came down from Philadelphia mid through the year. Uh, his brother was shot and killed in front of him. And he was trying to get out of, um, I don't want to reveal too much information about that student, but he was trying to get out of uh, a rough life on the streets. Let's just leave it there. And he was doing great things, great strides. But he spent the first two months of my class asleep in the back of my classroom, hardly ever talking to me. And it wasn't until like the third and fourth market period. He started doing all of his schoolwork, and then he became one of my best students. Mm -hmm. I didn't give up on him, right? So I allowed him to bloom to where he could be, but I had to learn his story before I could get him to where he was. Yeah. How do we reach educators, all teachers, that it is just as important to learn their students' stories as it is to teach them the curriculum that's in the books? I think what you just said right there is reason enough. You have to get to understand your students in order for them to open up towards you. Because I think a lot of learning is being open to it. And if you're learning it from someone that you're closed off to, and that's also, you know, closed off to you, it gets lost in translation. It might be hitting other students, but it's not always hitting, you know, everybody else. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. I mean, you have to resonate with these instructors, and that's why, you know, we want to see people who look like us because we have that assumption that, you know, they'll understand our story. Right. Yeah. That's kind of an interesting assumption, too, because I'm I'm also curious, somebody that doesn't look like you, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. could they still understand? Definitely. Okay. Right. I just wanted to see, because you went back to that a couple times, I wanted to see how you felt about that on the other end. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Yeah. I don't think that, I mean, I definitely think that color and race play um, a big role in how you can relate to some people. But I think that there are certain 
people that don't look like me that I can definitely have an open and honest conversation with them about how I feel about my race. And they don't necessarily have to, you know, be like, oh, I relate to you because they can't. But they definitely can be, I hear you. I understand what you're going through and I'm going to do what I can to help change that. Yeah, no, I mean, sympathy and empathy, you know what I mean? Like, it's just all subconscious. Like, I just assume, you know, someone like that would understand. But, right. like, you don't know until you know. So right. That's why we want these conversations. Yeah. yeah. I love the word empathy. Yeah. Empathy is a good word to use there. <laughs> it's, it really, you know, the difference between sympathy and empathy is empathy is actually getting in the person's shoes. Right. Sympathy is looking at the shoes going, I feel bad for you. Mm-hmm. Empathy is putting the shoes on and going, I'm going to walk this next mile for you. Yeah, I've been in this it's, situation. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a completely yeah. different uh, perspective in place. So, how long has the Black Culture Club been at Cap Calloway? It's uh, still so young. It's, yeah. yeah. Is this its first year? Yeah, yes. this is the first year. We okay. had kind of trouble getting it started up. Um, and trouble how? The trouble for participants or trouble getting the school to recognize it? How, how'd that go out? I think just trouble getting it like approved and kind of getting um, our message across and what we kind of wanted the uh, the club to look like. And then also making sure that... Um, uh, we're taking seriously yeah, for lack of a better term making it marketable to everybody else because mm-hmm. that's definitely one of the requirements that we had to meet was um, it has to be inclusive of everybody so sure right yeah, uh, that's, yeah. that's another good question is it an inclusive club Right. Um, the title, our, our group title was very misconstrued. You know, people have taken it that way. Of course, the Black Culture Club. I've seen Facebook replies upon the situation saying, like, you know, having black in the Black Culture Club is already, you know, not including people who are not that. Okay. And it's just like, no, that's not what this means. We're learning black culture in this club. We're recognizing yeah, black right. culture in this club. And it's very inclusive. Anyone can join. And that's something we're definitely, like, expand upon in marketing this upcoming year. Yeah, I definitely think moving forward, We want to make it known that you don't have to be black to be in it. And I think a lot of what we're trying to do is educate people who aren't black in the club. Yeah, we've had white members. Yeah. Yeah. And like a lot of it is. uh, And I think a lot of our club members and even myself have kind of battled with this is kind of like. We want to have our own space and you definitely do need all black spaces that are only for black people. But then at the same time, you also need to educate people and have an open and honest space with them. Because a lot of the times you can go um, you can go on social media and you can look at, uh, you know, any any sort of political outlet or any sort of news outlet. And you'll see people just going in on each other and you lose the education in it. And it more so just becomes making a mockery of people and not actually educating them on this. And you need a space where you can have an educational conversation where it doesn't become hostile right yes you guys have a bright future in front of you both of you <laughs> like really you do I, I don't think you realize that you, you guys are old souls and I, I love it i like this conversation Thank you. um a lot of maturity here in in the room and, and wisdom dropping that you're not even sure you're aware that you have um so that's awesome as far as just getting it set up and figuring out. And I also love what you said about, yeah, you do need your own space. I think that's really important because I, I, I think that we live in a world sometimes that is so quick, especially on social media, to say, well, you put black in the name, so how inclusive is this and everything else? But why does that really matter? Right. Right? Like, why don't we just cut to the chase? Like, why does that bother you as an individual? Why are you even calling that too? But that seems to be what social media brings out in yeah. people. It's the, if I could torch social media and just like get rid of it tomorrow, I would, because um, I think our world would be a better place. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. But I mean, it's not so but, many conversations but you know what? too. And yeah. also, I find that it's a light bringer into the world because it shows me, at least as an individual, where people are. Mm-hmm. And so, social media is also a gift because yeah. what used to be in the shadows is now brought to light, and you can live in the light of knowing. And knowledge, at least, is powerful. Yes, so that's we, good. We wouldn't be here having this conversation without social media that's true so <laughs> this whole platform social media so <laughs> but, that um, makes sense <laughs> yeah i think just to kind of go back to um you said why do people even think this way i think people kind of get messed up in the conversation of race especially non-people of color where they're like let's just get rid of race in general like just abolish the whole system of race and you can't do that 
Uh, especially not here in America, where race yeah. has been such... Our country has literally been built on race. Right. Um, you know, you have so many systems that are built on race, that are built on the oppression of other races, and you can't just erase that. And I think people try to get in this, well, I don't see color, um, <laughs> sort of uh, mind space. And it's never about if you can see color. It's about how you treat color when you are presented right. with um someone that doesn't look exactly like you so yeah i think i think a mandatory trip for anyone should be go to colonial williamsburg hmm. and learn the real history of colonial williamsburg uh, my wife and i took our family down over easter break and my son wants to be a builder when he gets older he's five years old <laughs> but he, he saw the workshop and there's these two big men you know doing the old way building stuff right and this guy just leans over to my wife and i and he's like let me tell you a little bit about why builders were so important. He said, a person like myself, a black man, I would have been over here because my slave owner told me that I could be here to build, more so because I was making money for him. And all these homes that are here that you've seen that you're going to walk through were all built by the backs of slaves. And they were paid for their labor, but it went to the slave owner. And so if you owned the slaves, you got richer and richer based upon how many more slaves you could have. And basically, when you look at Colonial Williamsburg, you go, that's the way America was built. And that wasn't that long ago. Right. Like, that, that's the thing that I think it's lost on people sometimes. People go, well, it's 2019 now. Okay. It wasn't that long ago in our nation's history that this was still going on. Yeah. Um, and so when people tell me I don't see color, that normally sends up a red flag to me of why. Yeah. Why don't you see color? <laughs> color is a beautiful thing. You should see color. Yes. That's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's an important thing to recognize of all other people because then you're recognizing their personal history, right? Yes. You're recognizing who an individual is as an individual, like a uh, Spanish person. Yeah, Spanish culture. There's a beautiful part to that. I'm Irish. There's a part to Irish culture, right? So, like, whatever it may be, I think it's important that people at least recognize that. But I think Williamsburg is a great place to become educated on why race and racism matter so much in the United States still in 2019 it should not be gotten rid of. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion on the whole thing. I'm not sure if you've ever visited there. Certainly mm -hmm. you probably know the history, but to visit there and actually see it and understand the way uh, they prospered and how that affected the rest of the United States at the beginning, I think is really important. Yeah, wow, that's very interesting. Is that like a tour site? Or, yeah. it, well, it's funny because depending on who you get as a tour guide down there depends on how upfront with you they are about that. Mm -hmm. We found that there were people that were very uh, open about it, uh, spoke uh, very much uh, from a, a racially uh, woke standpoint, <laughs> um, for lack of better words, I can come up with on yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there were people that you're like, wow, um, still holding on some racism. And that was just my wife and I's impression when we were down there. Uh, yeah. So it kind of depended on where we were, but it was part of some of the tours that we had. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's all about yeah. experience, seeing those different uh, sides of it and how right. people just have that outlook and how they uh, see the history. That's right. very important. Yeah. Yeah. It brought up great conversation for, for my daughter and for my son, uh, you know, because uh, my, my daughter was even talking about like, well, mommy and daddy couldn't have been married back then. Right. <laughs> and so, like, that's a great conversation for us to have with our kids. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, something that needs to happen. My yeah. culture field trip. So, so important. Yeah. Well, um, that's what I'm saying. Like, maybe that's yeah. a good yeah. field trip or some type of, I don't know. I think that would be really interesting to, to go with and under that light. Yeah. I just got back from um, Washington, D.C., and I was able to get a nice uh, little private tour of uh, the, um, the Capitol building. And it was very oh, wow. interesting just walking through that building and... Um, obviously going through what I had just went through um, three weeks ago with the walkout and, you know, just what I know off of history and hearing, you know, what our tour guide is saying and, you know, just looking at the building and looking at all the architecture and how it's built and all that, like, hand paintings and the, you know, hand carvings and all those kinds of things. Like, this was built by slaves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right. I heard nothing about it. And then I whispered to my mom and I was like, so when are we going to get to the room about um, how all the black people built this? And she was like, Trip, it's not on the door. Stop it. And I was like, um, 
And then I said, well, I'm upset about that. Right. So, yeah, I think it's it's just, it's a very interesting conversation that needs to be had about why aren't we talking about it more. Even the, uh, what, like Washington Monument, that was, uh, that's an Egyptian style, like, yeah. know, structure there. Like, and that's not even talked about. You know, the fact that we have a right. former president in that. And if you go back to that Egyptian history, you know, he doesn't. He, he shouldn't be in terms of like, you know, who, you know, historically we're, we're putting that in that uh, tomb. Yeah. Was that an obelisk? Obelisk. Right. Yes. Yeah. The obelisk. I was trying to remember what the word mm-hmm. was as you were saying. I'm like, what is that? I also just think it's interesting how we kind of ignore it or, you know, as like my mom said, no fault to her, but, you know, it's not on the tour. Like, why? Why isn't it on the tour if, you know, America in general um as american culture we are so consumed with uh this sort of patriotic like we love america go america but you only talk about certain parts of american history and if you're so proud of american history and how far we've come then why aren't we talking about all of the history why are we still only talking about george washington and how he was the first president and he came across the delaware why can't we talk about that George Washington also had slaves and right. discuss that kind of um, difficult, do we still honor George Washington because he had slaves? Or do we just ignore the fact completely that he had slaves and just honor him as our first president? Yeah, I mean, to jump back onto our, our, formal sta- our former statements, of course, we're trying to uh, we're trying to like shine light on the fact that we want to diversify these texts and our educational environments, of course. I mean, just the fact that we only talk about slavery and, you know, in the light of black people, it doesn't seem very, uh, you know, uh, encouraging you know, yeah. to want to you know, hear about all the time. Right. Yeah. And another big problem is and why we need to make uh, African-American history classes a part of curriculum is because and when I say your history, I mean white American history is already built into the curriculum and African American history is an elective. That right there, it's 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 unequal opportunity to hear about your right. your very own history. And, you know, we do talk about, you know, people are gonna bring up, you know, we talk about slavery, we talk about the civil rights movement, but we talk about the exact same people every single time i've heard about martin luther king since i've been in the third grade you know and it's like in order to get the knowledge and things that i have on you know the civil rights movement when it comes to you know um uh the black panther party and how rosa parks was not the first person to do what she did you have to go to outside sources to get that information you have to watch your own documentaries you have to take time out of you know your own education to actually learn. Right, and that's all you get is like the statement that Rosa Parks wasn't the first and they'll just leave it at that and just yeah. move on. Yeah. Well, I think that you're actually finding a good platform then. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I What it sounds like is you just stated it really well. The history textbooks uh, are white America, mm-hmm. right? And we have, everybody knows who Eli Whitney was. Everybody knows who Martin Luther King is. Harriet Tubman was. Rosa Parks why don't we know the rest? Why do you have to take a general elective? Maybe that's part of what the Black Culture Club focuses on at some of the points of how can we create a curriculum for the state of Delaware, not just at Red Clay, but a history curriculum that is comprehensive and is really the history of America for everyone. Because if America is supposed to be this big melting pot of all cultures and all races and a, a very diverse uh, country that celebrates freedom, shouldn't that be part of the curriculum? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, I think that that's actually a, a kind of an interesting place to start. You said it really well. Why isn't the elective? Um, and so that's that's a great conversation to have with some of the leaders. Yeah. Why is it the, that only an elective and why is that not an alternative uh, or why is it not built in? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a history teacher, so I, I don't have an answer on that. But I think that's a good part of the conversation. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you kind of your cafeteria is split, mm-hmm. right? So you have black students sitting with black students, mm-hmm. correct? And white yes. students sit with white students. How do you feel that the Black Culture Club could uh, come up with ways 
to help blend your community a bit more, become the melting pot? Yeah, I mean, it's just all about, you know, having this educational, you know, understanding, you know, in these classrooms. And then, you know, maybe they'll feel more comfortable with uh, getting this uh, first person experience upon like what it is like to, you know, be a part of, you know, this black group, this black community, opposed to seeing, you know, what happens on the news and, you know, how our pop culture is, and, you know, and having that kind of like, you know, interpretation of what it is to be black, you know, maybe we just have, you know, just go, it all comes down to like, you know, inst- instructions. Yeah. And just to kind of um, clarify that statement, it's not that we don't have white friends right. or that we you know. Oh, no, no, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. no, 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 no. But like, just like, <laughs> it's just like that just happens so naturally. And that's been right. happening for um, years. There's a book called Why All the Black Kids Sit Together in the Cafeteria and Other um, uh, Racial Issues That Go in America. But uh, I just find it so interesting that that still is the dynamic even so many years after that book was written and then so many years after the reason why that book was written that that's still why it goes on and i think a big part of how we can kind of blend um blend the two is honestly yeah like rodney said keeping the conversation alive and you know being able to sit down and actually have lunch with somebody outside of your direct friend group because even all the kids that sit together in the cafeteria we're not all friends right, we right. just sit there because it's, it's a comfortable space it's, to right. sit and we know that we can you know be loud and sing the stevie wonder version of happy birthday and <laughs> not be looked at crazy by you know whoever else is sitting uh Oh, we, at the lunch table with us i, I do that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> I do. And I just think that's how things have gone for so long. I think me and my friends, um, when we got there, the class of 2017 was leaving. And I remember sitting there and being like, all of us sitting at the table and being like, okay, so when they leave, when we come in the sophomores, we're going to take over their table because that's how it goes. And that's just how, like, we graduate to their table. And then the freshmen that come in when we leave, they'll take over our table. And it's just kind of been this natural um, flow. And then I also think within the community, Uh, having a conversation of why is that and Mm -hmm. why don't we feel comfortable doing that because i think we all know why we're just not having that kind of open dialogue with each other yeah i mean i'll use this example because it might be easy to kind of do without like where i went to college we called it a baseball major all the entire baseball team literally sat by themselves Mm -hmm. every single (laughs) meal in college me as not being on the baseball team, I didn't feel comfortable walking up to the baseball players and sitting down, even though I had a couple of friends that were on the team. I just never really felt like I was like, well, that's the baseball team. And they sit together every single meal. Do you feel that, you know, maybe that could be a place to start as part of your group to just say, you know what, we're switching where we're going to sit today. We're going to sit at a table with a bunch of other people just to make sure that other people know that they're welcome with us any day of the week. Because do you also, I would say that you may have some students that go, I don't know if I feel comfortable walking over there because I really, yeah, I'm kind of friends with a couple of them, but like, I'm not really that good of friends and I don't feel comfortable. I think it would be reinforcing, like it's a self-reinforcing habit. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 Yeah. So I think that might be something too, like just change where you sit and shake it up. Yeah. Make people uncomfortable. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, (laughs) you gotta do what you gotta do. I don't think that my thing is how do I word this it's not making it not being not having to take everybody else's comfort zone into account right you know what I mean and I think that's a big part of how we push things forward and um we were talking about this back in February we were working on our show and we were like, okay, so how do we want our show to look? So Black History Month Assembly. Yeah. Okay. So we were like, how do we want our Black History Month show to look? What stories do we want to tell? And we were in, you know, our classroom where we meet. And a big topic of conversation was, do we keep telling the same stories that have been told? Or do we take people's comfortability and interest out of it and tell the stories that we want to tell and that also need to be told does that make sense like yep. taking out everybody else's comfort zone because we've had to you know 
form and come uh, and fit into everybody else's. So why can't we chart to have everybody else Absolutely. kind of come together and fit into yeah. ours too? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I commend you guys. I, I, I can't say that enough. Like, I, I think that you're undertaking something that in 2019 is really important. You mentioned politics earlier. Uh, you know, we, we could probably have a, a, an hour long conversation just on how modern politics have affected issues for teenagers upon race and everything else nowadays. But you don't have an easy uphill climb, even though you should. You don't, because I, I understand it's, it's, it's such a multifaceted uh, topic that's going to have a lot of support, but you're also going to have people that you just have to educate constantly. And yeah. That's mm-hmm. the toughest part, yeah. right? Um, so if there's people from other schools around the country that are watching this, listening in, what advice do you have for them as far as setting something up similar at their school and trying to affect positive change at their school? What, what, what would you say to another teenager? Uh, well, actually, by result of this, we've been approached by many different uh, organizations, diversity groups of, uh, you know, people in, of schools in our district. Uh, AI DuPont has a diversity group that's been mm-hmm. in contact with us. And we plan on, you know, connecting our groups and having discussions and, you know, just uh, instilling some new opportunities and new programs and projects, perhaps. Yeah. Um, uh, my uh, message to students who feel as though, you know, they understand where we're coming from and, I hope this we were the voice and I hope we represented you well and we I hope we provided you some courage to actually stand up and you know change something in your school. Yeah, um as far as going to create something like this in your own school um and I think a lot of people look at it from like a system standpoint and you know kind of rearranging the system. I think if you want to really shake up the system, you kind of have to go in it from the inside. So talk to your administrators about how to get a club started and find a teacher that you actually trust a teacher a guidance counselor whomever that you trust enough to have a club like this because you're definitely gonna get looks from other teachers about why you even have this club in the first place and you know if there's a black student union or a black culture club why isn't there a white one (laughs) (laughs) you're gonna face these conversations and you're gonna have to you know battle and deal with these questions So I think a lot of it just comes from actually going out and making sure that it's a safe thing to do in your school, because in some schools it's definitely not. But then also just if you are able to do that, just do it. Yeah, you got to shake things up sometimes. You know, if people are mad, then you're doing something right, you know. Yeah, Yeah, you definitely (laughs) aren't going to be able to please everybody with it. I know I definitely haven't been able to please everybody, you know, with everything that I've been doing and... I don't really regret that because at the end of the day, I think if you look at it from this, at the end of the day, when you're looking at history, what side do you want to be on? You know, because to me, if you're remaining complicit, if you're not even able to recognize what's going on, you're not helping anybody and you're not helping to solve the issues in the world. Even if you do recognize them and you're, in a position where you can do something and you're making the decision to not do something, you are just as well as a part of the problem. Even if you do recognize the problem, if you're not doing anything to help solve it, then you're not doing anybody a favor. Right. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is be the change you want to see in the world. And so you guys have definitely started being the change. And so if you're a teenager out there, I think that Drew just gave you excellent advice. Find that teacher, find that moderator, um, you know, Ronnie, you shake things up, right? Be yeah, willing to shake it up. If you got people happy with you, you're probably not doing a good job. <laughs> and that, that, that's so true. When you yeah. go to work, eventually, when you guys are out in the working world, it's the same thing. As long as there's somebody that's upset with me, I know that I'm doing my job. I know that sounds like a horrible thing to say when yeah. you're working, but like, you need to have somebody upset because it means you're affecting change. Yes. And that's a positive thing in the world. There's three guarantees in life. Most people think there's only two. Benjamin Franklin said death and taxes, uh, but it's death, taxes, and change. Yeah. Change is a constant in life. It's always happening. Um, but, yeah, so if you're a student out there and you want to do this, um, you know, um, I will uh, put up any contact information that you guys want to give me mm-hmm. as part of this podcast. I'll put that in the link uh, that you guys are going to find out there on iTunes or YouTube, wherever you're watching this or hearing this. Um, and also on our Patreon page, uh, patreon.com 
backslash the outlet podcast where you can sponsor the show. If you'd like to sponsor uh, the Black Culture Club at Cab Calloway and make a donation directly to them, uh, feel free to sign up on Patreon and just put a little message that this is for the Black Culture Club. So that way I know to designate your money directly to you as a, to continue the great work that you're doing over there as well. Um, and I thank you so much for taking time July 1st, middle of summer break, coming in here. <laughs> thank you. And thank uh, you. doing this podcast. And I want to catch up with you guys again. Let's set something up like January. I'm kind of curious. It's like this first half of the school year, mm-hmm. a year under your belt. How are things going? I'd love to have you back and hear a little bit more about how the group's doing, how things are growing and kind of where everything's going from there. Thank you. Does that yeah, sound good? Course. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I appreciate awesome. that. And I believe yeah. you have some social media. I don't know if you want to. Oh, yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at Cab Calloway Black Culture. Um, we post con uh, updates every once in a while about any outreach programs that we might be doing when we're working. Um, we're currently working on doing a, a big sister, big brother program with Warner Elementary School, where we kind of help them prepare for the assessments for CAB and kind of giving them advice on how to, you know, go through middle school and then eventually, you know, how to go through uh, high school and just just ha- being that person in their life to kind of guide them from a person who isn't uh, an authoritative figure. And you can also follow us on Twitter. I think it's CCSA um, Black Culture Club as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank oh, you so much. Yeah. I, 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 who, who was that? No. Oh, oh. It's fine. <laughs> no, I'm all right. It's all okay. Good. Sorry. I, I got confused. <laughs> it happens a lot. Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. So go on to the Instagram page, check in, find out. And that's a great way that they can contact you as well and find out yeah. for tips. Go you can there. DM us our emails also on there. Um, Perfect. We all, all the BCC board members, we have access to the email. So we're always on it. Um, nice. Checking to see if any emails we get. Uh, like you said, our personal emails will be down there too. So if you want to email us, uh, check my phone every five seconds. So right, yeah. I'll definitely see it eventually. Um, yeah. And catching up with us. I also think it's interesting to mention that we graduate on the one year anniversary of the walkout. Oh, and I just think that's kind of oh, like wow. kind of bringing yeah. it off for the ultimate walkout. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I just a diploma as you walk. <laughs> yeah, I just think that's interesting. So. That is right. excellent. Yeah. Well, I would like to, you know, hopefully I'll be able to be there for your graduation too. We'll see yeah. what happens. Thank you. Yeah, yeah be awesome. absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being my guest. This has been another episode of the Outlet. Uh, we thank you for your support again. Patreon.com backslash the outlet podcast we thank so much of you for uh, donating your money and to the efforts of supporting teenagers uh here in the state of delaware and around the world that i interview Uh, i've been greg bolden i'll see you again for the next podcast pretty soon everybody stay safe have a great one take care Mm